And I'm, I'm sorry that I already introduced uh, Scott Ford, but I'm going to introduce him again. Um, so please welcome uh, Scott Ford, CEO and co-founder of Corgi Bytes. Um, Scott loves fixing and maintaining existing applications, so much so that he's built a team of like-minded people to focus exclusively on legacy code projects. Through his business, Corgi Bytes, he helps businesses breathe new life into old code. He calls this software remodeling. Just like uh, how you wouldn't bulldoze your house if you wanted to update your kitchen, it's often more cost-effective to improve the app you already have instead of starting over. Scott specializes in test-driven development, Yay. And uh, loves working in many languages, platforms, and frameworks. Welcome, Scott. And with that, I'm going to let you get started. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Are you able to hear me okay? Uh, you're coming through loud and clear. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So thanks so much. So what I'm going to talk to you about about today is kind of is the idea that communication is just as important as code. And this is one of our, our core values at Corgi Bytes, something that's that's really kind of foundational to the way we work and, and what we do. I kind of start things off with a story. So this is a picture of me with my, with my business partner, Andrea. We went to high school together um, and uh, we met back up together after 10 years at our high school reunion. And you know, I'm very much your typical, stereotypical software developer. And Andrea is very much not. Um, when we first started working together, Andrea was by far the better communicator between the two of us. Uh, her degree uh, at university was in marketing and business law. Uh, she had a lot of success uh, working as a copywriter, but she did dive headfirst into the software world and learned a ton. Uh, she learned how to code. She learned how to, you know, work on websites. She, you know, she learned JavaScript. She learned CSS. She learned HTML. These were all things that she didn't know very well when she first got started, um, and we, I've been trying to do the same with communication. I've tried to like dive in and learn how to be a better communicator and, and really communicate my ideas more effectively. But we've both faced some harsh stereotypes when, when forging through this journey. Um, Andrea is often asked if she codes um, and following a long meeting with a client where she was doing most of the talking and she was doing most of the technical talking. Uh, she was met at the elevator um, and the, uh, the person who we had had this meeting with who had been listening to her the whole time said, oh, by the way, do you code? Um, and she got so frustrated with this that she uh, put a tattoo on her wrist, <laughs> on her right hand, so that next time she shook someone's hand, like it would be obvious that like, like she, you know, she's making a statement that yes, she, you know, she codes. So um, I've also had to deal with struggles. I've also had to deal with stereotypes. Um, but for most of my career, what I've been told is that I shouldn't be talking to customers. Um, and this idea has even been commented on in some movies. This is a, um, a scene from the movie Office Space, if you're not familiar. It's, it's, it's very amusing. Um, go check it out. Um, but if someone was put between me and the customer with the idea that I wasn't capable of communicating with, with a customer, like that it was not a good idea to have me communicating with them. And after time, I really started to believe this. Um, and by the time that Andre and I started working together, communication was something that I just flat out avoided. Um, I would intentionally ignore emails. Um, and when I would write them, they would be as short as I possibly could make them. I tried to be incredibly efficient. I got really frustrated when I had to repeat myself. These were all things that I found you know, really frustrating and really tried to optimize out of, of my day. But Andre really challenged me because I really take pride in being a polyglot developer. Um, I like this idea that uh, I can work in many different computer programming languages, and I really take pride in my ability to do so. And so Andrea's challenge to me was to add another language to my tech stack. Um, and, and so this is a challenge that I extend to you as well, uh, to add another language to your tech stack, whatever that might be. And it's your team spoken language. And for, for me, you know, my, my team spoken language is English. Um, but it needs, you know, whatever whatever language your team uses to, to talk to each other about your project, make sure that you're really paying attention to the grammar and the syntax and the tone and the clarity and the cleanliness of that natural language. Um, because, you know, all the same things that you would value when you're writing code, value those same things with the words that you're choosing um, when you're communicating both verbally and in writing. And if you feel that communication isn't important, um, consider the impact that it has on a code base. 
because it turns out that your communication structures really do matter. Uh, so at Corgibytes, we, uh, like Mark said, we specialize in working with older neglected systems and we genuinely enjoy transforming them into modern, clean, uh, you know, clean, uh, you know, making something move from a dirt field to a, to a green field. Um, but we have noticed a theme over the years that poor communication creates poor systems. And there's even a law about this, uh, kind of a, a systems thinking law uh, called Conway's law. And this is why we end up with legacy projects that have to be rescued. Um, it's not because the technology is bad. The technology is often is often good. Um, but what is bad is the way that the way that ideas about the communicate about the technology have been communicated. And the organ the way the organization is structured has really kind of created a challenge and makes it has made it difficult for people to communicate. Another way that this shows up is that organizations will divide people into, into two buckets. This is something we, we often see with organizations that are, that are struggling with this problem. Um, they divide people into technical and non-technical. But here's the thing, it's, it's not an either or. Um, being technical or non-technical, it's not binary. Um, we, are quickly approaching a a, we are quickly approaching a world where communication skills are no longer optional. You have to be both technical and non-technical. Um, so, what we encourage people to do, and we even when we hear people use this in conversation, we try to stop them and say, hey, you know, it's not that you're not technical, it's you may be less technical than somebody else. So really try to make that your the conversation, like you're more technical than some people and you're less technical than other, other people. Um, but realize that if you're working on a software project in any capacity, um, whether that be documentation, whether that be, um, you know, uh, as a business analyst, whether that be as a, as a scrum master, you know, whatever your role might be, product owner, you are technical. You, ha you have a lot of technical information about the system that you're working on, and that information is valuable. Um, this also shows up a little bit in the idea of degree envy. Um, and something that uh, has been going around for several years is this idea that you don't have to have a degree in computer science in order to be an effective software developer. Um, and, you know, this is something that, that has, uh, that I've seen come up with a lot of people who are especially getting into the world of software and getting into the, the world of technology and working on software systems. This is something that really kind of weighs people down, but you really don't need it. And on the, on the flip side, you know, I don't need to, to have a degree in communication in order to be a better communicator. It's a, it's an attainable skill. It's within my reach. Um, it is going to take me outside my, it has taken me outside of my comfort zone and it will take you out of your comfort zone. Um, but that's where the magic happens. Like, like when you're outside of your comfort zone, that's when magic genuinely happens. That's when you grow as an individual. But let's do a quick crash course on what communication is. Um, and it starts with the, with the question, what is communication? What, is it, what does it mean to communicate with somebody? The real core and the most important thing to understand about effective communication is that it's rooted in empathy. Uh, empathy as a noun, um, it's a thing that you acquire. It's a skill that you build. You get it by listening and truly understanding to another person, even if that person is your future self. And that's, that's something to keep in mind when you're working on software systems is that the, decision, the decisions you're making today are likely going to affect you in the future. And once you've acquired empathy for the other person, the other audience that you're working with, um, you apply it by looking at that person's perspective. So imagine your future self and imagine what your future self is going to need, or imagine the other people who are gonna be on the receiving end of, of what you're creating and imagine what they're going to need. We can also describe communication by looking at the R.
Hey, Scott, uh, did you actually accidentally mute? We can't hear you. And you were saying really clever things that we liked. Okay, Scott's going to be right back with us. But um, in the meantime, while uh, he comes back, I, I want to make sure that you um, show our sponsor some love. Irish uh, Village and checking them out. Scott, uh, can you say something? No dice. Um, we still can't hear you. Uh, so like I was saying, uh, we uh, thank you to the sponsors for uh, API the Docs. Scott, are you with us? Are you able to hear me now? It's probably the audio is probably not. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, yay, technology. <laughs> so give me just a minute to start sharing again. Okay. Um, so... So there are also non-obvious forms of communication. Um, on the synchronous side, we have eye contact, uh, body language, uh, and kind of you know, punctuality. How how you know timely are you when you show up and have a conversation with people? Um, and they're nonverbal ways of communicating, and they're they're things that we don't often think about. And then on the synchronous side, when working on a software system, there are a lot of uh, other artifacts that we leave behind that are that happen asynchronously. So we're, the commit messages that we, we leave behind when we're adding um, adding code to our system, the way we name things, the way we, way we name API endpoints, the way we name um, entities in our system, the, the way we name the variables and methods and the, and the classes that, that we're building, um, the way that we name the scenarios and tests that we write to validate uh, how well our system works. And when we do code reviews, the the conversations that we have with people on pull requests and, and within those code reviews, and even timesheets and and like like why timesheets? If you're in an organization that like works with a customer, like where you're like charging by the hour, um, you, your timesheet and the information you put in your timesheet is is a place to have empathy for your customer. Uh, it's like the information that you put there is going to let them know like what were you working on instead of just having like eight hours and basically saying stuff. You know, like have a little more detail about what what went into your day and like where their money was spent. Um, and and finally, like a, a, this is a huge pet peeve for Andrea, but like uh, error messages, um, you know, error, method, error messages are, are a place where you get to communicate with with the, you know, the customer, the, the person who's using the software system. And it gives you an opportunity to have empathy for them. So, you know, communication is the, you know, the artifacts of your ideas and it's the artifacts that you leave behind. And there's a, a lot of different forms of communication and a lot of different forms of artifacts. Um, but it's not that different from code. Or like, you know, the, the artifacts that we have in our in our code are very similar to the artifacts we have in our communication. And if we think about legacy code, um, a you know, a common definition of, of legacy code that was left uh, that was created by Michael Feathers is that you know, legacy code is code without tests. Um, and at Quirkybytes, we've extended this to say that. Legacy code isn't just code without tests, it's code without communication artifacts. And tests are a very important communication artifact um, when considering a, a software system. And you know, it can help to think of a software system as an archeology span project um, where you know, tests might be something like bones, like bones can tell you a lot about a society, but you also have other things that you'll find uh, when you're working in on an archeological dig, pottery, coins, buildings, writings, paintings, all the other things that you might discover, you know, communication is very similar. It's a lot of different things that all add up to give you insight about what you're working with. So why does this all matter? Like, why, why should we care as, as individuals or are people working on software systems? I mean, why should we care about communication? Uh, so one is to, is to really level up. Uh, you know, if you're, you know, really, you know, relatively junior in your career and you want to move to the next level, um, maybe you want to be a lead developer, maybe you want to be a CTO, maybe you want to run your own business one day. Learning how to communicate effectively is a really, really important step in that journey. 
um, it's going to be an, it's going to be an increasingly um, an increasingly common and increasingly important part of your job. Um, you know, it can also show up if you want to contribute to an open source project or you know build a community around an idea that you're creating. Um, anytime you want to share your ideas with others, your communication is going to be incredibly important. Uh, communication also helps build trust with other other individuals. Um, in her book, Daring Greatly, Brene Brown describes trust as a marble jar, that every time you have an interaction with somebody, it places a marble in the jar, and like how many marbles are in the jar is an indication of how much trust you've built with other people. Uh, every communication artifact that you leave behind, every, every way that you document your thinking and document your understanding, it's another marble that you're putting in that jar. It's, it's a way to build even more trust with people. And finally, uh, you know, in the in the U.S., um, there's uh, you know fire, forest fire pr prevention, and there's this mascot for that, like Smokey Bear, and like only you can prevent for forest fires. And so, like, you're really kind of using this idea to think about like how do we prevent uh, incidents in the workplace? How do we, you know, like these incidents that you feel like you're having to address every day, and like feel like you're fighting fires every day. So instead of fighting fires, like finding a way to prevent them in the first place. And communication can be a very effective tool for do that, doing that. So being proactive and imagining um, scenarios that your coworkers and colleagues might find themselves in and really trying to uh, design for that by, by communicating your ideas. So just really quickly, uh, some patterns and frameworks uh, to, to take in mind for, for trying to improve your communication. One is context switching. Recognize that like context switch switching for developers is incredibly painful. Uh, this is something that like makes me want to flip a table anytime somebody asks me like, "Hey, do you got a minute?" Um, and so, when talking to Andre about this and like why that made me so frustrated, um, I you know kind of use the movie Inception as a metaphor for like I was like seven dreams down. I had built this world of like a dream within a dream within a dream. And when she asked me, hey, do you got a second? Like all of those dreams just evaporated for me. So we started to make this part of our conversation for like talking about like how many dreams down <laughs> into, uh, into what, I'm, what I was working on. Um, and that asking that question of like, what's my inception level? Instead of asking, hey, do you got a sec? Um, that's much easier for me to communicate. It, 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 it doesn't require as much thought. It doesn't require much brain power for me to assess um, the impact of, of that interruption. Um, and so the person who's asking me, like, you know, what's your inception level? If I say five and they really need to talk to me, they now know the cost of that. And they now can have empathy for how frustrated I'm, I'm going to be. Um, or if it's not very important, they could just say, okay, let me know when, let me know when you're closer to a zero. Uh, cause I'd like to chat. So that's a way that you can, you know, have, uh, a back and forth. Another is kind of the idea of like shattering glass. And this comes from um, a television show, uh, How I Met Your Mother. Um, and there's a character in that show, uh, Ted, who uh, in one episode, his friends point out to him that he always says, well, actually. <laughs> um, and in any, like anytime somebody says something, he'll say, well, actually it's like this. Um, and so instead of being, instead of acting like Ted, you wanna act like Tina Fey. And Tina Fey in her book, Bossy Pants, um, really outlines uh, really clearly like the rules of improv. And one of the most important rules of improv is yes and. So the idea of, you know, if you hear somebody say something that needs to, an idea that needs to be improved, instead of saying, well, actually, find a way to say yes and and build upon that idea instead of tearing it down. Um, and the last uh, communication uh, framework <clears throat> to think about is how to give and receive feedback without being mean. Um, and this is a framework that was developed by uh, by Kim Scott uh, while she was working at, on the AdWords team at Google. And you know she has the care personally access and a challenge directly access. Uh, and there's ruinous empathy, manipulative insecurity, <laughs> obnoxious aggression, and then what she cons strongly considers, strongly encourages everybody to reach for, which is radical candor. Um, and radical candor is when you're challenging directly, and you care personally about an individual. And there's some rules about how to do this. You wanna make sure you're humble, helpful, immediate. If it's criticism that you're delivering in private, if it's praise, deliver that in public and don't personalize the, uh, the, the feedback. Make it about the activity, not about the person. So 
just want to leave you with one thing. If you don't get anything else about that out of anything else out of this talk, just remember that communication is a skill. You can learn it, and I believe in you. Um, it's a journey that I'm on. I'm still on. I'm trying to get better every day, and, and continuing to continuing to do so. These are some great resources uh, that are books that you can that you can explore if you want to learn more about this. Um, and if you'd like to reach out and get in touch to have a conversation with me, here's my contact information. Hey, Scott, that was really great. Thank you for sharing that. And I can't wait to share your slides uh, with a friend of mine who's not attending the conference. And uh, I think after this, he'll um, probably try to attend the next one. Uh, I, I just I, I sent your description over to him and uh, he uses uh, the term modernizing uh, a legacy code. Um, where, where you were calling it remodeling, but he really liked your, your, your analogy there. So that was really good. Um, uh, I, I'm going to invite people to ask questions now. Um, Mark uh, commented on um, the trust point that you were make, making that bad or wrong docs is nearly, uh, nearly worse for trust and adoption than no docs. And uh, yeah, uh, that was a that was a great point. You had a very rich uh, deck of slides, and I look forward to getting that. Any any final words, uh, Mark? Uh, uh, Scott? Um, I'm Mark. Yeah, you're Mark. <laughs> I, I got up early this morning. Um, yes, yes. If you're in the U.S., it's a, it was early start of the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think you know just just um, you know. Communicating, especially with with uh, customers, especially through documentation, um, you know, the most important skill to really look at is empathy. And empathy is often thought of as something that's like really squishy and 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 something that um, you know we don't really have to pay a lot of attention to. But it is really important, especially in, in the realm of software and in the realm of of developing APIs. Um, and for communi you know communicating documentation through documentation to the customer to the person who's actually using. Uh, what's been built. Uh, and uh, my business partner, Andrea, she's actually working on a book uh, called Empathy Dri Driven Development um, that should be out within a year or so. Um, and uh, so you know, look forward to that and you know, reach out to her if you, you know, she's definitely, uh, she's the expert in my life about, about empathy and you know, uh, I can share my perspective of how I'm on this journey to get better at it and recognize that it's important. Yeah, I look forward to that book. That uh, that sounds really interesting. And um, you talked about a lot of things that uh, I had to learn the hard way. So hopefully if uh, some of our other attendees, um, if this was, if there were, if this was completely, completely new to you, I know it was valuable. And uh, hopefully uh, Scott has uh, some ideas to help you avoid some pitfalls. Um, so thank you very much, Scott.